Well, good morning, everybody. Again, so glad you're with us today. My name is Joel. I have the honor of being the lead pastor here. And if you're a guest in-house with us today, thank you for being here. We mean what we say. We don't want to single you out or embarrass you, but we would love to connect with you as soon as the service is done. The guest center is right out those middle doors, hook an immediate right. Uh, I'll be there just a few minutes after the service ends, but in the meantime, one of our great First Impressions team members will be there to smile and say hello. We have a gift for you. No strings attached. Just want to say thanks for being here. For those of you who are joining us online, we want to say welcome to you as well. We're so grateful that you're with us whenever and wherever you're watching this today. And we know some of you are checking us out. You're doing your homework. Good for you. We love that. But as much as we are glad you're there, you are going to love it when you are here. So we can't wait to see you as well. I want to start by talking about value, specifically value from our perspective. You ever stop to think about what makes something valuable? What makes something valuable to you? Is it the amount of money you paid for it? Maybe. Is it maybe how long you've had it? If you've had something a long time, maybe there's more sentimental value added to it. Maybe it's just valuable because it's one of your favorite things. So it's not so much length of time, but it's just you collect something and that something is valuable to you. Maybe you are like me and in your family, you have these kind of heirlooms that get passed down generation to generation. Sometimes it's a grandmother's wedding ring. Sometimes it's as simple as an old space heater that my dad refuses to give up, but one day will be mine. You know, these family heirlooms that get passed down, and most of the time, I mean, they're just junk. Most of the time, they're just things gonna collect dust in an attic somewhere in the corner of a room, and they're really not worth much, but they're valuable because they're connected to family, you know? And, And then you have those times that truly something is like really worth something. And maybe you've seen those shows where someone takes in this little trinket and they're like, ah, you know, it was my great, great grandmother's and I want to see what it's worth. And then like, it's worth like $50,000. And it's like, whoa, that's just crazy. This little thing they just had sitting around in an attic in a box somewhere rusting is worth all this money. Everybody's all ooh and amazed. But what made it valuable? Somebody decided it was valuable. I mean, that's the only reason anything's worth anything is somebody decided it was valuable and we all just accept their opinion. What, What makes swirls of paint on a canvas valuable? Somebody said it was valuable and we all said, okay. I mean, really think about it. What makes anything valuable? It's what we assign to it. It's what we kind of agree on, which got me to thinking, what if people are the same way? What if... What if we just changed our outlook on people and we viewed people as valuable, and if we viewed people as valuable, we would then begin to treat them differently? Because if you say something's valuable, its worth goes up in your head and in your heart. Now you begin to treat it differently if you think of every single person you meet as someone of great worth, someone of great value. What if it is just like swirls of paint or that family heirloom or that thing that you think is valuable? What if we looked at people the same way and said, you're valuable simply because I say you're valuable? More than that, because God says you're valuable. What might change if we viewed people that way? Because the flip side is we make ourselves look better, and there's only one way to make ourselves look better, and that is to make someone else look less than better. I mean, after all, what is second place? It's the first loser, right? They're the number one loser. So we only make ourselves feel better because they lost. Now, if it's a race or if it's something like that, well, that's the way life is, okay? But what if we're just talking about general value of people? Are there winners and losers? Or does God maybe view it differently? Does he maybe call his children to view people differently because he calls us all, who are disciples of him, new creations? He says that if we are in him, we are new creations. We have been born again, that there's something in us that has changed. And there's something in us that is changing, that the power of God has transformed us, and it is transforming us. That means we have to view people differently because they're not just things. They're worth way more than things, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But that's what we're talking about today in our message, part number eight, if you can believe it. Uh, The message is called Upside Down, and you don't have to have but a couple of brain cells up there to figure out we're talking about value and how God has changed it all. 
We're in Luke chapter 14, which is actually the very next chapter over from last week. It just worked out that way. Last week was chapter 13 in Luke's gospel. This week is Luke 14. It just happened to be that way. But it's verse 1 and then verses 7 through 14, and when we get there, I'll explain why we're skipping that gap in there. But it's page 713 in the Pew Bible in front of you, which is actually the very next page from where we were last week. And that Pew Bible is there for your convenience. If you want to see it in print, maybe you normally look at a print Bible or you prefer to see it in print, you don't like digital, great, it's there, it's page 713. If you don't own a print Bible and you would like one, there's an early Christmas gift. That's a gift to you. That's the main reason we have it. But whether you look it up in print or whether you look it up electronically, I really don't care. Come in with scrolls under your arm. I don't care how you get into it. I just want you to get into it because this stuff will change your life. And I want you to experience that and see that. But Luke's gospel, chapter 14, starting at verse 1, starts off one Sabbath When Jesus went to eat at the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Now, if we were in a movie, this is when you would begin to say the ominous music. The creepy music would start about now. Because this was a trap. This was a setup. Jesus was set up from the very beginning of this. But let me me break down a little bit of the scene. It's so important you understand the scene of what's happening, or otherwise what happens later on doesn't quite make sense. So Jesus is having a meal, probably lunch, and it's on the Sabbath. Now, why would I say probably lunch? Because in the Jewish mindset, the Sabbath began at sunset on Friday and concluded on sunset on Saturday. See, we go sunrise to sunrise. They went sunset to sunset. So this was probably lunch because they would have eaten their last meal of the day. It would have actually been on Sunday they would have eaten so late. So it's probably lunch. I'm not going to swear by it. Probably. So it's a lunch. They're after the Sabbath service. So it's Saturday afternoon. This was normal for people to go to other people's houses on the Sabbath. People still do that today. You go out to lunch together. We still do it on the Lord's Day. They just did it on Saturday. Okay. So they had this. But it was also common for people who had a little more prestige to invite people who had a little less prestige to their house. See, what would happen is you'd bring these people in and you'd be the most prestigious as the host. And so they would honor you by saying, oh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for having me at your home. Wow, there's, it was a way to receive honor. That was normal. People did that. So Jesus is invited to this prominent Pharisee's house. Okay, got to break this down. Pharisee. Who are the Pharisees? By the time of Jesus, Judaism had kind of been broken down into a few different groups, okay? You had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, you had the Essenes, you had all different kinds of isms and schisms. The Pharisees, though, were a special lot. They believed in strict adherence to Judaism. I mean strict, so strict that if God was vague, they filled in the gaps. They were the ones that told everybody, hey, if you walk this many paces on the Sabbath, it's okay. But if you take one more step, it's work, and that's a sin. They were the ones that told everybody that. Now, we look at that and we go, wow, what a bunch of judgmental legalists. No, no, no. In their time, they were extremely respected. They were called the holy ones, and it was not an insult because they were viewed as closer to God because they kept the law and they kept themselves separate from other people. And every Sabbath, they didn't mess with people who were ceremonially unclean. They were very strict. They had hardly any political power. The Sadducees had all that. But they had almost all of the social power. If they said it, people did it. They were like the religious leaders that people really respected. And this particular Pharisee was a prominent Pharisee. That meant he was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was the holiest of the holy ones. He was the most righteous of the righteous ones. He kept the law better than the other ones kept the law. He was a prominent and important, a well-respected Pharisee. And his eyes are on Jesus. But not to learn a thing, but to catch him. This rabbi who was a nobody from a backwater town is teaching and people are beginning to follow him. He wasn't a Pharisee, but this prominent Pharisee as he adjusts his robes is about to catch Jesus. He's about to get him good like nobody else did. Verses two through six happens to cover a very similar story we talked about last week. Not the same story, but the gist of it's the same. Someone needs healing, Jesus heals them on the Sabbath, and there's a controversy. He did that a lot, okay? So I don't want to go back through verses two through six because you can go online and listen to that message called Improperly Proper, change the characters, and it's basically the same story. I mean, just the same thing happens over and over with Jesus because he keeps doing the Father's will on the Sabbath and the Pharisees have a problem with this. 
So that's what happened. But Jesus easily gets out of this trap. It's just laughable how quickly he just gets out of this. So the Pharisees kind of thwart it again. And Jesus says in verses 7 through 11, when he, that is Jesus, noticed how the guest picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. Now, a parable is Jesus often used. It's a, it's a simple, like, earthly story, but it has a kingdom of God emphasis. But he's using an illustration everybody would understand. He tells this, this story. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host will invite both of you. Excuse me. The host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he'll say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the guests. For all those who exalt exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. See, Jesus, the master teacher, wastes no time (laughs) by focusing on their hearts and ours. Now, a parable is often very good practical advice. It's a lot like the book of Proverbs. It's very simple, it's very easy to understand, kind of hard to implement, but easy to understand. But Jesus wasn't just giving good social advice. But it is good social advice, right? Don't go to a party and put yourself in a place of prominence. You're gonna embarrass yourself. That still works. But Jesus wasn't just talking about that. That's why he, he wants to make sure we get this point. He starts to always move at the end. At the end of the day, he goes, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, or those who humble themselves exalted. Because he's starting to drive to the point that he's talking about this practice that religious people did in his time, and still do today, of vying for position in the kingdom of God by being holier than thou, by being a little better than everybody else, being more of a Pharisee than the other Pharisees, by being a little bit better. And the only way to get there was to knock somebody else down. And Jesus is saying, don't don't fight for a position in the kingdom of God by kicking someone else off a pedestal. That's a dangerous spot because if you get there, the host, that would be God, might come along and say, you don't deserve that spot. Go back to the back of the line. And so Jesus is telling them, in a spiritual sense, you better avoid all that. That is not a good thing you're trying to do. And that's the real meaning of what this parable is, that he's telling them, quit vying for position in the kingdom of God by kicking other people out. See, that's what the Pharisees did. But Jesus goes on. He goes on in verses 12 through 14. He doesn't want anybody missing this point. So he says, when you give a lunch, he turns back to his host, this prominent Pharisee. He says, when you give a luncheon or dinner, Do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. See, the challenge to this prominent Pharisee and to us is the same for all of the righteous people, that the challenge for the righteous is maintaining humility. It's a weird thing with pride. The more holy we try to become, sometimes the more prideful we can become of the very thing. And Jesus turned back to his host, but he's not whispering, but he's addressing his host. And he's saying, now, I know, and I'm gonna put this into Joel Ease for you, okay? He's saying, Jesus is telling him, look, I know this is normal. This is what you do. You invite people of slightly lesser stature, of lesser respect, so that you're honored, and then you turn the tables. They invite you, and you're the person of honor at their lunch. But see, it was, it was really abnormal to invite someone who would have been really low on the social echelon. You wouldn't have invited those people because they can't repay you. They can't turn around and give you a lunch where you're the place of honor. And a Pharisee is not going to be seen with someone who's crippled or poor or lame they're not going to do that. So they, they, they just wouldn't have been in the realm of possibility. And Jesus is saying that's exactly who you need to invite. Because if you can do something with someone and they can pay you back, you've not really done something for the kingdom. You've done something for yourself. See, there's that idea that the only reason we can get ahead of someone is because we kick someone down. And that we can, we can make them feel inferior. It, it's a funny thing how we compare You know, when we compare ourselves spiritually to other people, we tend to compare ourselves to people that we know we're better than. You know, I'm just being honest. That's what we do. We don't compare ourselves to the Billy Grahams. 
We compare ourselves to the person who is more messed up than we are, and we go, well, look how better I am. Well, the Pharisees did it too. I guess people have always done this. This is just kind of human nature. And in his commentary on this passage, N.T. Wright wrote this incredible commentary called Luke for Everyone. I highly recommend this, this series. I know it's for the New Testament. I think he did it for the Old Testament too, but I know it's for the New. It's called like Luke for Everyone or John for Everyone or Matthew for Everyone. And what he does is he, and in front of his name, he's got a doctor. He's just this walking brain on a stick. He's just genius. But he has a way of just really bringing this down to my level and just to the street level where we live. And in his commentary on this passage, he writes this, pride notoriously is the great cloud which blots out the Son of God's generosity. If I reckon that I deserve to be favored by God, not only do I declare that I don't need His grace, mercy, and love, but I imply that those who don't deserve it shouldn't have it. That's what Jesus was talking about. This idea that, that we get on that pedestal by knocking everyone else off. It's a funny thing with humility. About the moment we think we've got it, we just lost it. You can't say the sentence, I am humble. You, you cannot say, once you say it, you're lying. You can't say that. You can't even think it because you're lying. That's the point, that humility is, it, it, it's, a, it's a razor's edge between pride and humility that we get more looking like Jesus and you'd think we would become so aware of our own sin that we wouldn't have time to look at everyone else's because we're so busy going, Lord, there's so much you need to work on me, but the problem is our spiritual eyes very often become magnifying glasses instead of mirrors. And so then we start looking at everybody else saying, wow, you are really messed up. Wow, I can't believe you would do that. And the whole time Jesus is saying, you need to make sure your spiritual eyes are mirrors and you're seeing yourself clearly, that you're seeing yourself for what you really are and not what you think you are. Hey, that's what he's saying to this Pharisee right here. He's saying, do this for these people that cannot repay you, and then God, your host, he will repay you. Jesus came along, and he took every concept of value and worth and flipped them on their head. No wonder so many regular people followed him, because Jesus turned prestige upside down. Jesus is the one that said the first will be last and the last will be first. He's the one that said those who exalt themselves, they get crushed. But those who crush themselves, they're the one God lifts up. He turned prestige upside down. In the book of Hebrews, we read this in Hebrews 13, 15 through 16, this reminder, therefore, uh, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. You hear that emphasis? It's not just believing, doing, praising. It's actually the action of serving others because Jesus turned prestige upside down. He said it's not for them to look at you and say, wow, what a great Christian. It's for them to look at you and go, wow, what a great Savior. That, that we're simply reflecting what he's doing. We're not the point. Jesus turned prestige upside down. Proverbs 15, 33 says, Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, and humility comes before honor. That's probably where Jesus was coming from. That's probably was the emphasis he was giving that day at that lunch, because Jesus turned prestige upside down. And it's so easy to believe what we think we're hearing a story is told of a, of a little donkey who was just minding his own business. And this little donkey was just doing what little baby donkeys do, eating, standing next to its mother. And then these guys with really rough hands got him, yanked him away from his mom and his hay, and donkey's mad. Man, donkey's infuriated. I do not want to go with you. Donkey's pulling a little bit. These guys finally with their big rough hands managed to get this donkey right, and they put a hot, itchy blanket on his back, and then they put a guy sitting on him, and they kind of pat his bottom in, so he starts moving, and as he's going into this place, he sees these people are singing and shouting, and they, they begin to put down these, these palm branches, and the donkey's like, wow, 
My, my little hooves aren't getting dirty because they're putting down these branches. And he starts holding his head up really high. And he's pr- by the time he gets to the end, he is prancing through town. But then he realized, these people weren't cheering for me. They're cheering for that guy who was on my back that they called Jesus. You see, don't believe that every cheer is yours. Sometimes the cheers are just for Jesus, that you're just the donkey carrying him in. Because Jesus turned prestige upside down. They're not really cheering us. They're cheering the one that we are carrying in on our backs. We need to be the donkey and see value from the Lord's perspective. But we need to see how he caused us to behave and how he caused us to act. You know, around here we say a lot, there's hope here. We print it on things, it goes out on everything, it's on our social media accounts. And that is not just some kind of marketing slogan. We didn't workshop that, we didn't send that out to focus groups, not knocking churches that do, I'm saying we didn't. This came to us kind of an accident because someone said this about us. But when we say this, do you understand there is an implicit and explicit promise? If you were to hear those words and you came in and you felt so low that when you looked up, you saw the bottom of your shoes, you were so low, and someone said, there's hope here, how would you feel? The promise of that is saying, I don't care where you've been, you're here now. There's hope here. You have found it. There's hope. We're not standing in a place to look down on you and judge you. We're standing in a place beside you to simply help carry you to the water. We're not in a place to say, look, you, you just sit over here and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> We're the ones who go, hey, come, come sit by me. You're home. You found it. We're the place that says, hey, I'm not so sure about this Jesus stuff. And, and we go, that's okay. Borrow our faith until you have your own. It's all right. People have done it before. You can do it. To just, could just come up. There's hope. You found it. It's a promise to walk with people, to, to walk alongside, to say, I want to do something for you that you cannot repay me, and I don't even want you to repay me for. Uh, we, we had this uh, thing happen years ago that, and I, I've struggled for two weeks to even tell you this story because it goes back to what Jesus said about you know, not doing something so that you can get repaid. So I'm going to say this in the most generalized way possible because it really makes this point. But just realize I struggled to even tell you the story, and you'll see why in a minute. But we've been saying there's hope here for a long time because it was five years ago someone said it about us. And then 2020 hits. Y'all remember that? You remember March of 2020, what happened? Early, early March, late February 2020, there's this big conference call for all the churches, faith-based nonprofits. Uh, non-Christian groups were on this conference call with the then city manager and the deputy city manager and they're just saying, hey, the governor's about to shut the state down and we're, we're a poor county. And so we're really, we're really leaning hard on the faith-based community hoping that you guys can help us out and that you can come alongside and we're probably gonna have to give out food. We're gonna need some place to store it. As, as supplies come in, we need big like warehouses. We need space. We hope you'll say yes to giving us space. And I mean, I was like, okay, yeah, we got this. That's what we do, we got this. I'm, I'm not saying I'm thinking it, I'm thinking it. And then my phone buzzes, hey, I look at it. And it was a city official and, and they said these words. I know I don't have to ask your church. I already know you're gonna tell us yes. And I was like, you're exactly right, we'll tell you yes. You just tell us when. We already said yes because even our city leaders know there's hope here. I'm not saying there's not hope everywhere. I'm not saying that, I'm saying there's hope here. And we see that example, and that's you. That's not me, I'm one guy. The ambassador for the church, sure, I get the honor of being our ambassador when I go to city events. Absolutely, it's an honor, it is. I I love doing it in your name, I love it. But that's not me, that's you. That's your heart. Your service, when we have these go days, it's all those being stacked up together and people going, man, that church is weird, but I like it because there's hope here. So here's my question. Do you embrace the upside down nature of the kingdom of God? This totally flipped concept of value and worth. Because I'm, I'm gonna be the first to tell you that this is, this is not the American way. You see, in the American way, You're only valuable if you can offer something. I only need you if you can give me something. Give me work, 
Give me a relationship. Give me a stepping stone to connect. But you're only worth something if you can give me something. That's the American way. The kingdom of God's way says you are made in the image of God and you're worth something, period. He thought you were worth dying for, so you gotta be worth that much to me. That's a very different mindset. The American way would say that human life is cheap. It's expendable. If, you're, if you have a mental illness or if you have or if you're poor or if you're a certain kind of poor or if you're too rich or if you're if you have a past or if you have this the, the American way would say well, you're you're less than in society the kingdom of God's way says Jesus said come to me all you are burdened and I'll give you rest so come on that's a very different mindset I mean, that means you're gonna view everything very differently, that, that even as we listen to the news, we will view it through a very different lens. Which leads to the second question. Are you ready to meet needs? Probably the best piece of advice I was given a few years ago by a much older and wiser pastor. He said, you know, I think sometimes we gotta tell our people, turn off the news and go talk to your neighbor. And just, just talk to them. They're people, they're humans, made in the image of God. The news makes their stories off of dividing us. Just go talk to your neighbor. What, what if they have needs? Well, go, go tell your, make sure your neighbor knows who you are so that when they're out of town, they know, hey, I'm keeping an eye on the place for you. I, I know who's coming in and out of your place. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure they know that. That's a need they're gonna have. And you'll, you'll need it too, but my point is, meet their need. Because you can't meet needs if you're busy ranking in value. Here's a tough one. When someone is poor, do you think they're lazy and that's why they're poor? If you think that, then you won't meet their needs because you think their need is simply a whip on their back and get to work. Now, are there some people who are poor who are lazy? Well, yes. There are some people who are rich who are lazy as well. Laziness is not an income bracket. Okay, but that's not an excuse. That's not an excuse at all. Or, or, do you look at someone who is wealthy and you think, oh, they're just greedy. And that's the only reason they have money. Are there some people who are wealthy who are greedy? Yes. Are there some poor people who are greedy? Yes. Greed does not have an income bracket. But if we think that way before we see them as valuable in the kingdom of God, we won't bother with their needs. We won't bother trying to reach out. Uh, for about 20 years now, uh, I've been taking the advice of someone, a radio guy, on how to, how to help people. And I'm a real student of the concept of don't hurt someone when you're helping them. You know, sometimes a handout is not the best thing to do for someone. Sometimes it is. But the idea of just see what they need, not just the surface level want to make yourself feel better. So uh, roughly 20 years ago, I adopted this idea. Like you, I go to gas stations. I also mow my lawn. Somebody was surprised by this one time. They're like, you mow your lawn? I'm like, who else is gonna do it? I do normal stuff. I don't just preach all the time. I don't just sit on you know, a mountain and just talk to God all the time. I gotta mow my yard and I gotta go to the gas station and buy groceries and pay bills and everything. And so, you know, like you, I'll go to these gas stations or something and someone will say, hey, can I have a few bucks? I'm gonna get some food. Now in that moment, I have a choice. And 20 years ago, I made this choice, and that is my answer was gonna be, no, I'm not gonna give you money, but, so here's what I say every single time. It is so mechanical now, I don't have to think about it. Hey, can I have you bucks for some, to get some food? You know what, I don't have any cash on me. Pause, that's true. I'm, I'm a spender, so if I have cash, it's gone. Okay, so I, I don't have cash on me. It's not good for me, my wife takes my cash away. It's not good for me to have cash. So it's the truth, that's, for me, this is the truth. Now, I don't have cash on me, but, We'll go right into that little convenience store and I'll buy you anything and everything you want. Any, any food you want. I won't buy you alcohol, you don't need that. I'll buy you anything else. Ah oh, man, just a few bucks, I'm just gonna go down to McDonald's or I'm gonna go to Burger King or talk, whatever the closest you know, fast food joint is. And I say, hey, that's not really the healthiest thing for you, I'm not knocking it, I, I like some junk food too, but look, I'll buy you junk food in there too. But let's get you some staples, you know, let's get you some, I'm a big fan of spam, you know. Let's get, some spam, get something you can eat. You know, that is gonna last you. Let's, if you have a way to cook, let's get some rice. Let's get, let's get some food, I'll, and I'll buy you junk too. And, and, and inevitably, it's one more round. No, oh, man, I don't wanna be in any trouble. Just give me a few, you've already been trouble, so let's just go in here and get you some food. <laughs> no one needs to be hungry. And I always make the joke, I'm like, I don't miss many meals. 
and I don't think you should either. So let's just go in, and I start walking. Let's just, if I'm done pumping gas. Let's just go in here and get some food, anything, all of it. 20 years, I've had one person take me up on it. And this one person, I'll never forget it, because it's just once. Man, we must have bought, and this was a long time ago, $100 in a convenience store used to go someplace. They walked out with like two bags of groceries, and I'm like, I remember going, Lord, I don't quite know how I'm going to pay for all that. Remember, I don't carry cash, so it's on a credit card. So I'm like, i got to pay that credit card. But it's like, you know what? I did something for someone who truly could never repay me. And you know what? I don't remember ever missing that money. I don't know how God did that. I paid it, obviously. I don't remember. But the point is, it didn't matter. So we're, we're not just saying walk out there and just kind of just say, well, look, I'm just going to put myself in the poor house so that you can just have everything I own. Here, here's my house. Here, here's my car. Now, if the Lord tells you to do that, do it. I'm not, uh, but I'm not, I'm not telling you that. Joel's not saying, Joel's saying, Scripture tells us to be innocent as doves, but shrewd as serpents. Our brain is supposed to be there. But if we're not ready to meet needs, if we're always so busy thinking of the next thing and the next place we gotta go and doing this and doing that and doing this, then you miss those chances to actually bless that one person. Does that mean that all the rest of them were faking? No, that doesn't mean that. Does it mean that, that maybe that one person really pulled the wool over my eyes? I, I don't care if they did. I really don't care. That's not between them and me. That's between them and the Lord. I don't do it for them. I did it because I believe Jesus calls me to do that. But that's what I mean. We've we got to be ready to meet needs, ready to step out, ready to say, you know what? I, I'm not just going to give you a blank check. I'm not going to do something that might hurt you, but I will do something you need. Why should there be anyone hungry when a Christian's around? Why should anyone be thirsty when a Christian is around? Why should anyone need anything if a Christian's around? Again, I, I have made no bones about this. I've been very honest with this. I don't think welfare is the government's job. I think it's our job. I think the reason the government did it is because the church stopped. That's just my opinion. I don't necessarily have a scripture verse to back it up, except Jesus told us his people are to be his hands and that we are to be the ones serving. Do I mind the government doing it? No, it needs to get done, but it's us. We, we should be the ones making sure no one has need. That's our role, that's our joy. That's what we're called to do, not to adjust our robes trying to find excuses for why we don't. It's our job to go, look, you have a need, whatever you need, I'll do. You say, Joel, that's a blank check. I know, and it's scary. But like I said, I don't remember missing the money. And 100 bucks back then was a lot of money. Now it's 100 bucks to fill up your tank, but that's another story. But look, you know, when Jesus came along, he took this whole concept of value and worth and prestige and importance in the kingdom of God, and he just flipped it and said, the people that we think are the least are the ones who are the most important. They need us the most. And the ones who don't and are self-righteous, eh, the Lord will take care of them. I, Jesus took prestige and he just flipped it upside down. We would be wise to follow his example and keep it that way. Let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. Thank you for letting us be your hands and feet. Thank you for modeling so well how to serve others and that you didn't ask us to be millionaires to do it. You just said, open our hearts, open our hands, and you'll do the rest. So help us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.